evening, everybody. Welcome to our fourth annual Stonewall Lecture at Roger Williams University School of Law. My name is Ralph Tavares, and I am the Law School's Director of Diversity and Outreach. Before we begin, I want to take a moment to reflect on the lands on which we reside. We are coming from many places, physically and remotely, and we want to acknowledge the ancestral homelands and traditional territories of indigenous and native peoples who have been here since time immemorial and to recognize that we must continue to build our solidarity and kinship with native peoples across the Americas and across the globe. Roger Williams University School of Law is located here in Bristol, Rhode Island. And so we acknowledge and honor the Narragansett and Poconocet people and Soames, the original name of the land on our campus where it resides. We also acknowledge that this country would not exist if it wasn't for the free and slave labor of black people. In this time of national reckoning with our history of slavery and the disparate treatment of black people, we honor the legacy of the African diaspora and black life, knowledge and skills stolen due to violence and white supremacy. While the movement for justice and liberation is building and we are witnessing the power of the people, many are still being met with violence and even being killed. As upholders of justice, our hope is to become agents of change for members of our society who have been met with violence, physical, mental, emotional, through our privilege as students and soon practitioners of law. Welcome once again. We are so fortunate to have an audience tonight from all over the place. Feel free to utilize the chat function and share with people where you're from, what your current year is at the law school, the firm you represent, community organization, or high school. Once we begin with our fireside chat portion of the program, we will give you the opportunity to ask questions through the Q&A feature with the help of Kate Vieira from the Office of Admissions. I will be reading your questions during the program unless you would like to read your own questions live during the program. All you have to do is write your question in the box and indicate live read in the Q&A and we will put your camera and microphone on. We have registered everybody so we are hoping for no Zoom bombs but this is again 2020. To start our program and welcome you all to the virtual community, I would like to introduce the Dean of Roger Williams University School of Law, Gregory Bowman, to share some opening remarks. Greg. Thank you, Ralph, and good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Greg Bowman. I have the honor and privilege of serving as the Dean at the Roger Williams University School of Law. And on behalf of our law school community, uh, our Office of Diversity and Outreach and our student organization, the LGBTQ Alliance, I am very pleased to welcome you to our fourth annual Stonewall Lecture Series event. The Stonewall Uprising in New York City in 1969 played an important role in our nation's history. And it has been recognized for its role in the LGBT rights movement, as well as for playing an essential role in feminist history. As many of you know, Christopher Park is a small community park in Greenwich Village in New York City. It is located just west of Washington Square, and right across the street from Christopher Park is the Stonewall Inn, um, for which the Stonewall Uprising is, is named. The Inn was a popular gathering place uh, for the LGBT community in New York. And on June 28, 1969, the police raided the Stonewall Inn. The raid sparked a community protest that lasted for days. Uh, Christopher Park served as a gathering place and a refuge for people who gathered there to demand LGBT civil rights. While some may not have realized it at the time, the Stonewall Uprising was in fact a turning point in our nation's history. It was a key catalyst for the modern LGBT civil rights movement. The Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. famously stated that, and I quote, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Reverend King did not mean this as a statement of historical determinism, but rather as a statement of faith and perseverance in seeking justice. And so in 2016, nearly five decades after the Stonewall riot, uprising, a presidential proclamation designated Christopher Park as a national historic monument. And in this proclamation, President Barack Obama stated that, and I quote, the designation of a national monument at the site of the Stonewall Uprising would elevate its message and story to the national stage and ensure that future generations would learn about this turning point that sparked 
changes in cultural attitudes and national policy towards LGBT people. Now, our law school's annual STEM lecture series seeks to serve this goal and to help make our nation more fully inclusive for all. It is important that we do this. It is vital. In this year, the fourth year of this lecture series, we find ourselves stepping both forward and backward, both toward and away from full inclusion and belonging in our country. For example, this year we witnessed the landmark Supreme Court decision in Bostick versus Clayson, Clayton County, in which the court held that Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 protects employees against discrimination due to their sexual orientation and gender identity. And yet we are also seeing marriage equality being questioned. This year we also witnessed public outcries for justice in the deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery only to have members of the trans community seeking similar justice without any media attention or recognition. We can and should be thankful for the progress we have made in our society, but we also must be mindful of the work that lies ahead in LGBTQIA plus rights and Black Lives Mattering and fighting injustice everywhere. Also, in the legal profession, um, it becomes better when we celebrate and honor and seek justice for the lived experiences of the people we serve. And yet, marginalized communities and identities continue to be grossly underrepresented in the legal profession. And so, part of the change that we desperately need is to work with vigilance to ensure that often excluded or silent voices are not just at the table but also leading us in discussions so that they give voices to stories and perspectives we don't always hear. And this benefits us all. So this evening, we are so fortunate to have Bendita Cynthia Balakia with us because of all that she embodies within this movement. And to illustrate why, uh, let me share a quote with you from a recent interview she gave at the National LGBT Bar Association, where she is currently a board member. Bendita said this, and I quote, we need to keep each other's lives and lived experiences at the center of our consciousness. We could all progress much farther together if we constantly remind ourselves of our shared humanity. So listen to what she said really hear it. She said, each other. She said, progress. She said, shared humanity. These are wise words for all of us to live by. Inclusion and belonging are about all of us. So now I'm going to turn over the floor to RWU law student, Lindsay Farvent, who will introduce our speaker this evening. Lindsay is a second year student at Roger Williams University School of Law. She is currently a Rhode Island Sea Grant Law Fellow for the Marine Affairs Institute at Roger Williams University. And as a member of the LGBTQ plus community herself, she became president of our law school's LGBTQ plus Alliance student group to further promote diversity and inclusion in RWU law, the university and the greater community. Lindsay, thanks very much for being here tonight. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Bowman. Hi, everyone. I'm Lindsay. We are very excited to have our fourth Stonewall Lecture Series this year. These events are very important as they highlight the struggles and progress of the LGBTQ plus community. I hope this lecture can impact you all in the way it has impacted me in the past. I'm very excited. On that note, I would like to formally introduce Bendita Cynthia Malakia. She is the Global Head of Diversity and Inclusion at Hogan Lavelle's, which is a 2,800 lawyer international law firm that operates in 46 countries. She is working to transform the legal profession into an inclusive industry where women, people of color, the LGBTQ plus community, differently abled and other professionals are able to thrive. Prior to Hogan Lavelle's, she has experience as a lawyer for a law, large law firm an in-house counsel at two global financial institutions, a diversity consultant for large and mid-sized organizations, and a certified professional coach. 
She is currently the treasurer of the LGBT Bar Association and sits on the Mansfield Rule Advisory Board for both the, both the U.S. and the U.K. And finally, she graduated from Barnard College and Harvard Law. Welcome, Bendita. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, thank you all. Um, I'm Bendita Cynthia Malakia. Um, Blessed Moon Goddess Queen is actually the literal translation of my name. At some point in time, I'll start introducing uh, myself with that first. I'm representing a combination of cultures. Um, and today, I'm honored to explore interactions at the intersections with each and every one of you. I am Black. I, I laughed all the way out loud when I completed the census this year. Um, I don't remember exactly what the question was, but I read it as, what kind of Black are you? All kinds of responses popped into my head, including Angolan American, regular black, black AF, blackity black, 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 and, and the list goes on. And anyway, um, I digress, I'm, I'm black, and it's, it's one of my most salient identities. I'm bisexual, uh, I'm a woman, I have a, a child, and, and while I identify as a woman, I identify more as a father than as a mother, so don't, don't ask me about motherhood. I'll look around and, and wonder who you're talking to. I'm, I'm cis, um, feminine presenting, which offers me some privilege as a, a queer woman, um, some other privileges. I'm able-bodied, I'm an English native, I'm socioeconomically privileged as a result of a Harvard Law School law degree and, and having had some success career-wise within large institutions that people have heard of. And, and by the way, that wasn't a privilege that I achieved alone. Um, it was on the back of parents I made hard choices between culture and, and access to resources. I'm a terrorist attack survivor. I have anxiety, some mild OCD, some as a result of that terrorist attack, but some has always just been a part of my special sauce. I'm semi-intellectual. I'm a lover of Cardi B, Dostoevsky, and career development podcasts. I love pineapple margarita cocktails, pretending to be a lay herbalist, and the Pittsburgh Steelers. So my in intersection is, is interesting and, and chaotic, and yours may be too. Matter of fact, I know that at least socio-politically and macroeconomically, societal interactions are at their peak in 2020, and the dichotomies are wild. COVID-19 and its disproportionate impact on queer and minority communities, the Bostic decision, which is one of the most significant civil rights rulings in years, giving LGBT plus folks rights that they should have already had in the workplace federally. A racial reckoning emerging from the killing of George Floyd occurring during an administration that refuses to recognize the humanity of anyone that isn't white, straight, cis, and who, in the midst of that reckoning, has the gall to ban diversity and inclusion training as un-American, including education on intersectionality. All of this, regardless of the fact that my primary takeaway post-George Floyd killing was that people of different races, sexualities, gender identities, we may all occupy similar space, but we truly live in different worlds. And more than ever, we need to encourage more dialogue about difference, not less. Not talking about it is a great way to perpetuate hegemony and the status quo. Those that don't want change don't want to talk about it. This is one of the many reasons why I'm elated to be here at the kind invitation of Ralph Tavares, Director of Diversity and Outreach, Dean Bowman, Chelsea Horn, Lindsay Farbent, Kate Vieira, and the leadership and students of the Rogers William University School of Law. Others would retreat or be silent, and I am heartened that, though we are not in person, the dynamics of our world haven't kept us from being in community. What do we have to hope for, we who live at the intersections of multiple marginalized identities, those who experience discrimination that is synergistic and not simply summative? Three weeks before an election that will determine whether we devolve into anarchy or authoritarianism or certain death and destruction or alternatively on the blessed road to some semblance of healing that could lend credence to the value of a multicultural society. And yes, the choice feels that clear and stark to me. And I hope it feels that clear and stark to others so that we can all make what I consider to be the right decision for humanity this election. Our lives are at stake. The challenge is that it's always more complicated than that. The complication is the reason why we, the disaffected, are surviving and in some cases thriving. We are resilient. 
It's awesome, right? Because we survive. Resilience means that we are tough enough to survive what comes. It means we flex and we bend. It also means that we put the burden on the individual to negotiate with themselves how much they can and will take while still demonstrating achievement and alignment with our expectations. But everybody knows that the person that achieves the least in a negotiation is the one that negotiates with themselves. In some circumstances, we have people negotiating their own humanity, which we shouldn't allow to happen, ever. Now, don't, don't mistake me as naive I've been in the world. Resilience is critical. However, drawing a line in the sand of what is abjectly unacceptable is sometimes the only way to demonstrate what we stand for. And I would suggest that we, as a society, may have been too flexible with our democracy and our expectations over the last several years. There is a moment to affirmatively declare our beliefs and to act in alignment with them. And if not now, then when? My many identities drive my experience in the world. The loyalties can tear you apart. For those that may not identify as being intersectional, it may be news to you that every marginalized identity group has its own hierarchies. This is our dirty little secret. In the queer community, whiteness and cis manhood are prioritized over other racialized and gender identities. In minority communities, manhood, straight, and cis identities are prioritized. In women's spaces, whiteness, straight, and cis identities are prioritized. You get the picture. But that means that for people with multiple marginalized identities, life can be a constant battle for recognition. And these fights not only occur with people that are completely different, but with people that you want to align with and with whom you share some experiences with. This means that each and every one of us has a responsibility. Given that this is the Stonewall Lecture, it is a moment to reflect. Though sometimes debated, most acknowledge that the Stonewall Uprising was started by Black and Latina trans women. These are individuals who are powerful even though our society didn't recognize their humanity with any consistency. They would have been isolated in every space they entered. In fact, there is a record of frustration um, that they had with other allies, folks who said that they were allies, um, who didn't necessarily want to carry on the fight with them. As an LGBTQ plus community, we have the duty to ensure that we honor, respect, and support all members of that community. This means that we too must ensure that whiteness as a system of oppression does not prevail. We popularized allyship writ large. Now we ought to use it for the benefit of those that need it within our community. That means self-education and accepting challenges to our behaviors. That means creating space for others' perspectives and for them to shine. That means recognizing our own privilege and yielding the floor. That means not needing to solve the issues confronting gay men first, and then we can get on to what's happening with differently abled folks, bi plus folks, black and brown folks, trans folks, women, etc. Some of us have spent more time in religious environments than others, but it is definitively practicing what we preach that will make the difference. Asking people outside of community to stand up for us when we have work to do to advocate for and include one another is hubris, unless the solidarity we are trying to maintain is white solidarity. So what can we do? As a coach, a fundamental tenet is that we can only control our own actions. We can't even control the outcome, but we can control what we choose to do or what we choose not to do. And this is critical for individuals that have multiple historically underrepresented identities. You will often end up in spaces where you are the only or where most other people have no idea what your experiences have been or how to engage with you appropriately. Their ignorance is not your fault even though their ignorance may make your life miserable at times. We can spend lifetimes talking about the disadvantages that we experience, the loneliness, the stereotype threat, the lack of role models. We can talk about gender dysphoria, racial anxiety, and the intellectual and physical trauma unleashed by intentional and negligent action that often yields to disproportionately negative outcomes for people living their lives at the intersections. All of that is true, and nothing that I'm about to say absolves every single person from using their talent, skills, and resources to improving the institutions that operate to our disadvantage and influencing the individuals in our spheres. But what I'm talking about today is choice. That's where progress can be made. The first choice I want to talk about is choosing joy and creation and self-actualization. 
This may seem bizarre, right? Why talk about joy when a black woman in Louisville receives less justice in our legal system than a white person's wall? Where the bullets that missed matter more than the bullets that didn't. I want to talk about gender euphoria and racial enlightenment rather than dysphoria and anxiety because there's power in being the architects of our own experience. The inimitable James Baldwin once offered to us that you have to decide who you are and force the world to deal with you, not with its idea of you. One of the best gifts I have found occupying the spaces of blackness, womanhood, and queerness is that I have the opportunity to forge my own identity. When people think finance lawyer, I'm not the image that comes to mind, or law firm executive, or many of the other roles and spaces I have occupied, and I suspect the same is true for many of you. I have the opportunity to create my own professional image and personal image because I'm so far outside the bounds of typical identity that there aren't as many known stereotypes for black queer women, except for in the black queer community, and especially not in educational or professional settings. Instead of choosing obscurity or being designated inexplicable, I affirmatively and intentionally create my identity in alignment with my values. And so long as I take on the burden of being excellent at what I do beyond belief, I have that freedom and others accept that. There is often a negotiation between fit and competence. I talked a little bit about um, some of our Alliance students um, today about this. The honest truth is that you have more freedom to create an authentic image regardless of its alignment with the hegemonic structure if you are viewed as being competent within that structure and vice versa. Audre Lorde, another black queer woman icon, offers, if I didn't define myself for myself, I would be crunched into other people's fantasies for me and eaten alive. So define yourself today. It may sound naive to you or, or basic, but each moment is an opportunity to choose euphoria over dysphoria, to decide that happiness resides within. There are anxieties and pressures that come from living in this body with these identities. And others have additional pressures that come from other inequities. I invite you to choose joy. If I hadn't taken command of my own mental health and well-being, I would have succumbed to the many challenges that life has thrown my way, from growing up in a very white hetero context to navigating predominantly white institutions, academically and otherwise, to getting my life back together after a terrorist attack, to being divorced. Choose you. The second choice I offer to intersectional folks is to choose to persist. I know you're tired. I'm tired too, and I've chosen to advance DEI for a living in a corporate environment. Diversity fatigue haunts those who are in the trenches fighting for their identities, families, communities, and lives daily. But we must keep moving forward. And to do that, first and foremost, take care of yourself. A fellow diversity executive recently articulated, the healer must be healthy. But choose not to sit out this fight. Fight for yourself, fight for others. Everyone has some amount of privilege in some space. And it may be difficult. Matter of fact, it will be difficult. The research demonstrates that queer people take a hit for helping other queer people. Women take a hit for helping women. Que uh, minorities take a hit for helping other minorities. And it may be easier to fit in if you don't ruffle any feathers and just go along. You may have fought so hard for a seat at a particular table, and you may feel uneasy about risking that seat by raising issues. But I would challenge each of us not to feel so grateful for receiving what we are entitled to that we are rendered into silent bystanders. When we get our seat at the table, we need to make room for others and ensure that their perspectives take flight. The third choice I offer is for those that do not identify as being part of an underrepresented group. Choose to act. If you do not act, you are perpetuating inequity. Silence is collusion with oppression. Do not be an oppressor. You don't want to. And every single person has a choice. Ignorance is not an excuse in the law. Ignorance should not be allowed to prevail when people's lives are at stake. To be granular, as a professor, you can choose to be intentional about ensuring that queer people of color, queer women, queer deaf and hard of hearing folks, queer differently abled folks, et cetera, have opportunities to shine, that they have letters of reference written for them, that you can suggest them for scholarships and fellowships. You can be sure that those that have been historically marginalized are chosen for good assignments that are developmental and not merely administrative. As a university administrator, you can choose who is in the pipeline for leadership. 
as a student, you can make sure that underrepresented queer folks' voices are heard and not tokenized. You can give credit um, to others for their ideas. You can focus your scholarship on advancing equity. You can make sure underrepresented student groups receive equitable funding and that your leadership res reflects the aspirations that we have. Everyone has the power to use their voice. Choose to use your power for the benefit of others. It will be challenging. You will learn things about yourself that you may not have known, and you may even discover attributes that aren't flattering. Whatever discomfort you feel will generally be less than that experienced in the lives of intersectional, underrepresented people on a daily basis. Choosing not to use your privilege for eradicating inequity is a choice to use your privilege to maintain the status quo. Think about who you are and act in alignment with the person that you want to be. So choose. My final offering is to recognize the power of what happens at intersections, including at the intersections of identity. Think about Silk Road. Norms converge, patterns are interrupted, opportunities for creation and generating solutions and imagining a new way to live that better supports every single person become a reality. Experiencing how people with multiple marginalized identities forge those identities amidst the constant assault that the world can offer is a masterclass in how to live artfully and with intention. Others don't always agree with the term, but I call this queering life. And regardless of how you identify, I suggest that you think about the ways that you can queer your own life. By this, I mean that you have elected to honor your authentic self by living on your own terms, regardless of the norms society has set up, regardless of who may not like it or who may not agree. How are you intentionally asserting your own humanity and right to determine your future? How are you examining the rules that have been set up by those who may not have had you in mind when they were created and challenging them with conviction? Have you thought about the other parts of your identities that have not been supported? Though sometimes born out of tragedy and dissonance, queering is empowering. And with that, I welcome you to the intersection. I would invite Ralph and, and Kate to join me in conversation um, to talk about all these wonderful topics that happen at the intersection. Oh, bendita, blessed moon, goddess queen, thank you so much <laughs> for your words. <laughs> I want to remind people to use the Q&A feature at the bottom. Again, please share your questions with Bendita. And if you want to read them out loud, we will just put live read in there. Um, gosh, thank you so much for your words. Let me tell you, everybody's blowing up my phone saying she is the truth. We love her. So you have already made an incredible impact on this community. I, I want to start by asking there's so many questions I have for, for what you just shared. And I, I'm going back to the theme that you talked about, which was being resilient, being flexible, and being able to bend. And I think about that, especially as my identity as a black male, and I know certainly black women, black females, go through this kind of negotiation of how you show up. You know what I mean? And I think you, you talk a little bit about identity and, and being able to show up authentically, but not everybody is as bold or, or maybe they've gone through so much resistance that it's like, how do I show up without being labeled A, B, and C? Could you talk a little bit about that and, and maybe some advice to the students that are here and even, even the professionals that are here? How do, you, how do you be resilient, flexible, and bend? Mm. You know, uh, uh, part of my remarks were, were in part kind of challenging whether we ought to be bending as much as we have during these times. And so I would just offer that because I do think that there are some contexts where all of us have been way too permissive with um, what's acceptable. And I think especially in the political sphere right now, and, and I, I didn't want to go to the election, but I just I had a, I felt a moral responsibility to. Um, to do that um, here a few weeks before um, this election. But, you know, I have a challenging relationship with resilience. Um, and it, it comes even further than, than within the context of our election. Um, being resilient challenges the individual to have to change, um, to um, 
to survive in a system that probably ought to be different, right? And so we put the onus on the individual um, rather than the institution um, to correct itself. And while that's a great short-term solution, sometimes a not so great short-term solution, it's not a recipe for a long-term institutional change. Um, when we talk about labels, we can't control what other people call us. And I've had lots of people call me lots of things over, over, you know, over time. Lots and lots of people call me all sorts of things. And what I would have to say is that we can only control the image that we choose to put out in the world. Um, what you can choose is how you receive it. Um, and how you receive it takes a lot of mental training. Um, you need to think about who am I and does this statement actually really matter to me? Um, so, you know, if my parents say something, I saw, I think my father might have popped up in the chat there, which is wonderful. Um, you know, if my parents say something, I think about that a lot. They may not think that I do, um, but I think about it an incredible amount, right? I, I'll, I'll spend time agonizing over it, right? Because they matter to me and they matter deeply to me. They are fundamental to my identity. I am um, because they are. Um, but, you know, if, if a person on the street, you know, calls me a fag, or if a person calls me the N-word, or if a person, you know, any, any sort of epithet, you know, I can choose how I take that. It's like someone coming up to me and telling me your hair is purple. That's not going to mean anything to me because I, you know, I hope I have the right hair on today, right? It, it looks black to me, right? And so it doesn't mean anything to me. I'm looking at them like, oh, this person can't tell colors, or maybe they've got, they're differently abled and they can't, they're, they're colorblind or, or whatever the situation is, but it doesn't have an emotional impact on me because I know who I am. And that's how I view, um, that's how I view the ways that people come at you. And I think resilience is built first and foremost off of individuals really, really, truly knowing who you are and really understanding um, that you don't have to really answer to anybody. Um, you, all you need to do is answer to yourself. I hope that was in some way responsive. No, very, very. And I, I, I continue to means of self-care. And you and I were talking about that before we even got on tonight, about how you care for yourself. And, and you know, the reality of battle fatigue in the middle of mm -hmm. all this. Again, it's hard not to talk about the election in this moment. But I, especially when we're talking intersections and we're talking about identities, I think it's important to bring it up. And I think... Oftentimes we shy away from the discussion because of those labels again. Of, mm -hmm. You know, if you say the wrong thing, it's we're in this cancel culture where it's just like, oh, we're done with that. So to bring up the election a little bit, and I think more specifically LGBTQIA plus rights, mm -hmm. it kind of hangs in the balance right now. Not so much the election of, or, you know, the re-election, although that has a lot to do with it too, but the Supreme Court and Amy Coney Barrett. Mm -hmm. And thinking about your theme about building allyship and, and, and solidifying community, you mentioned three audiences at the end, you know, our allies or people who identify, how do we, what do we do right now? What are action steps that we can take in this moment with that kind of looming to help strengthen and solidify the LGBTQIA plus community? I mean, to me, the answer is simple. Um, you know, however you can, whatever privilege you have, um, you must donate, you must vote. Um, and it, it, those are, those are, are to me, um, basic fundamental um, actions that each and every one of us must take. Um, you can, of course, you know, write your Congress folks, write your senator. If you've got folks that vote, I'm in D.C., so our status is questionable. Um, but if you've got the privilege to spend a few dollars um, on a candidate, um, if you've got the opportunity, if you have a phone, and you can call somebody. But if the election doesn't turn out in a way that supports supports um, LGBT plus folks um, and our families, um, and you didn't do every single thing that you could do within your power um, to change that outcome, um, then we can't look at other folks. Like so many times people say, oh, President Trump is not my president. Um, I've never said that. Um, I am in the United States of America. I have enough privilege where if I wanted to move somewhere else, I probably could have. Um, and, and I am here yoked together with my fellow Americans, um, many of whom I don't agree with politically. And as a collective, we voted in, um, in accordance with the rules of our system, 
this president. Between elections, we don't care about the electoral college. So we need to stop acting like right around the election, we actually truly care about reform because I don't really see anybody do anything meaningful about it. Um, you know, a month after the election is over or, you know, or until six months before a new election. Um, and so we just need to be real about who we are. Um, but if we don't get what we want and you didn't pick up the phone, you didn't convince somebody else to vote, you didn't take people to the polls, you didn't drop off ballots, you didn't give $5 um, you know, to the candidate of your choice, um, then the outcome is on our shoulders. Each and every one of us has a responsibility. We can't talk about those people over there. And now if you've done every single thing that you can do, you may be able, you may want to grit your teeth a little bit, and that's unfortunate, but every one of us has to, has to act. Um, the election really does hang our, our lives in the balance. Um, our families um, are in the balance. Um, when marriage equality um, was passed um, in 2015, uh, my then wife and I were lucky enough to be the first couple in Texas um, to legally own um, same sex couple in Texas to legally own property together um, as a, as a married couple. Um, and that was a huge monumental moment that took weeks and weeks and weeks of advocacy and form changes and, and every bit of, of bureaucracy that you could imagine. But um, every once in a while, every couple of months or so, someone will still send me a note that says, thank you for being that. I know it probably took a lot of work at that point in time, but thank you for being that person. You want to be able to look at yourself in the mirror and say, um, thank you, self, um, for voting. Thank you, self, for having sent the amount of money that I needed to send. Um, thank you for supporting. Um, ballot initiatives that support our communities. Um, each and every one of us needs to do um, whatever we can. Um, the next president will determine um, the rights of our families for years and years and years to come. Thank you for that. We have a couple of questions in the, in the Q&A, um, and I'll read one of them. And I have a lot of questions, but I can't hog all this time. Queering is such an interesting concept. Am I correct that your point is that people of privilege can be allies by showing up at work as who they really are and not as who they are supposed to be? Or is it all about people being their true selves in order to strengthen our community? Or is it something else? I love this question, um, especially, I'm sure somebody else, you know, nothing's new under the sun. So somebody else has probably talked about queering things, but I haven't seen it yet. And so, um, you know, as, as any good intellectual, the concept is still in my mind developing. Um, but I think it's a bit of all of those things. Um, what I mean is, is that we choose each and every day um, to not allow the constructs of our society to constrain um, who we are um, at our fund fundamental core. So whenever we feel dissonance, right, we usually feel dissonance because of one of two or three things. It's either one, we are not living in accordance with our values, um, Two, we are living in accordance with our stated values, but maybe we got those values wrong. So maybe we're living in accordance with other people's values. Um, or three, um, somebody is just violating and annihilating our values. And so my view is that we ought to be looking at the rules that society has set up and, and say, why not? You know, one of uh, the most important moments of my life, um, however short-lived, um, was when I became uh, a part of my uh, seventh grade football team. Um, and I used to play um, football, tackle football in the side of our yard um, in Clay, New York, all the time. And I had a strong desire to play. Um, and my mother um, supported that desire. And she went, went you know, to battle for me. She wrote a letter to the president to get them to require our, our school district um, uh, to allow me to play, to allow me to try out. Um, and, and that was, I only played for a season, right? But it was really an important moment um, um, for me to see um, that so long as you are willing to try and so long as you've got an ally, and in that case, my ally was my mother. Um, I know plenty of people um, still who grew up um, where I grew up and they never would have done um, something a thing for their child. Um, but to have such great allies, um, you know, like my parents who are willing to say, you've got a reasonable dream. We know what the rules say. There could be some 
you know, there could be some challenge. Yes, she could get hurt, but anybody could get hurt, right? Um, you know, and are willing to, um, to walk in solidarity. I actually like walking in solidarity, even though it's a little bit ableist in terms of, of language construction, um, better than, than kind of being an ally, which feels a little bit more passive. Um, but being in solidarity with other people can be really, really um, powerful. And so I welcome us questioning um, what, why the rules are the rules. You know, not in, in the way of children, which is, but why, but why, but why, you know, it, you know not in that way. Um, but when you feel that dissonance, when you feel that tug, that fundamental violation of your own humanity, um, standing back to say, what rule is being violated in society as a result of me just trying to live my life? You know, um, and, and, and think about whether there's an opportunity um, to push against that rule or to even just live your life differently. So many times the, the, the barriers that we, we come up against are barriers that we've constructed in our own minds. Um, and so um, just thinking about the ways that we can, uh, can um, maybe blur the lines a little bit and challenge others to think a little bit differently and require others to go along with us is incredibly powerful. Everyone covers. Um, Kenji Yoshino out of New York Law um, has done a lot of research around this. Um, his book, aptly named Covering. Um, even 45% of straight cis white men cover um, at some point in time in their day, meaning they hide um, a piece of their identity because of fear that it won't either help them advance or that it won't be accepted in whatever culture they're in. And if straight cis white men are doing it, then everybody's doing it, you know, in, in a much greater extent. I think for black people, it's 82 or 83% of black people cover on a daily basis. Um, queer people, um, it's a little bit less than that. Um, but think about that. Every one of us is pretending. Every one of us is showing up to work, showing up to our academic spaces. Um, we're all showing up in drag. We're all pretending, all pretending to try to be some uniform thing that no one actually is. Um, and, and, and it's something to really step back and think about whether there's an opportunity for you not to, not to just be harassing people or to mess with people, but because you really truly want to exercise your identity where you are, um, thinking about how might the rules, how might I need to shift the rules a little bit um, to accommodate myself and by extension, um, you know, a, a Mandela quote that I'm going to, to, to butcher, um, but be a light for others um, to be able to, uh, to execute their own authority authenticity. Beautiful. And actually, the next question is a great piggyback off of that. Um, one of the attendees asked, can you speak more to the idea you presented of how we mistake or conflate fit with competence? This is an important topic for law students, especially those historically excluded from the legal profession, as they seek to define their professional identity and the job. How do we break the traditionalism that's inherent in the law? Mm, that's a great question. Um, and, and to clarify um, I, what I meant to say, and hopefully I, I said it properly, um, is that there's a negotiation between, uh, between fit and competence. And I think that happens in lots of jurisdictions, uh, lots of areas. So lots of professional spaces. Um, it happens, um, I think, sometimes even at home. Um, what we can get away with uh, in terms of fit, so we queer people don't tend to fit, right? Um, I'm here in my office at a conservative kind of AMLAW 50 law firm with my harness on. It's who I am, right? Um, and, uh, but the reason why I can wear this harness to work or in executive um, team meetings um, or at our diversity conference um, or, or with whomever um, is because there's a general understanding that I'm excellent at what I do. Um, and, and that's validated in this structure. Um, if I wasn't viewed as being excellent at what I do, if I wasn't deemed to have that competence, then people would be looking for me to fit into the culture a little bit more than I do, right? Um, and it's an unfortunate fact, um, but I often find that for I don't, you know, this isn't going to be fair. Your average kind of, your average kind of straight cis white man, you've got to have a relatively kind of average amount of, of fit and competence to do well at an organization. I find that for everyone else, um, you either need to completely fit in, you need to, you need to be really, really great at one of the two and slightly above average at the other. 
Um, so you either need to be extremely excellent at what you do, your work needs to be inviolable, people need to look at you as the expert, X, Y, and Z. Um, and in that case, you know, maybe you can wear your lavender suit um, to work or you can have your, your, your rainbow heels on at work, right? Um, maybe you can do that. Um, or alternatively, you need to be in your gray suit, you know, buttoned up, you know, take off your fashion classes, you know, keep the hair together, you know, however it is you choose to be. Um, um, but maybe in, in, in that way, maybe you fit a little bit better. Maybe you're muting some of your characteristics. Um, but in that way, um, you've got a little bit more flexibility on the competence side. Maybe you're just, you know, if you're honest with yourself, maybe you're just average at your job or slightly, you know, but you have a little bit more grace um, on that metric. And is, is that ideal? Absolutely not. I mean, this is, I mean, if you really listen to this, this is the kind of the compromise of all compromises. You mean to tell me um, that I, Gen Z or iPhone generation person, you know, young millennial can't just show up to work as my authentic self and have an equitable shot like everyone else? I'm telling you, the answer is likely not, not yet. Um, and that's why each and every one of us needs to constantly work um, in the areas where we have privilege. And when you've got the energy, when you're not beaten down by that fatigue, even in, in spaces where you don't, to constantly push for increasing acceptability of all of us and our identities um, in a way that, kind of, that supports all of us showing up just as average as everybody else. I want to have an off day, too. Yeah, and there's always this pressure like you have to be on, on, on all the time. And that's something that I grew up with. My father and my mother both said, like, you have to do extra. You have yep. to do more. Twice just as to good be. for half as much, right? Exactly. Connie so. said it in, you know, Between the World and Me, and, and it was something that resonated with me because it's something I've heard, you know, our whole lives. And it's, it's a given. Um, but to, to accept that as a given, is a, it's a really complicated thing emotionally, right? What you're suggesting is, is, that I, is that this is the world that I ought to accept. And what I'm telling you is that it's good to understand the reality of the situation that you're in. It's, it's, you need to know what you're negotiating with in order to properly negotiate. But you should constantly be thinking about, um, while understanding the reality, how you can um, work to try to, to, to blur the boundaries such that more people can be included in the fold. This really is, as Dean Bowman said, about, about all of us. Well, it was what you said, but, well. you know. <laughs> He said so it, and have, I said it, and we're all I know. It. You said it beautifully, and so did he. Uh, Brandon Carlton has a question. I'm not sure if he uh -huh. wanted to go on camera, but I'm, I'm happy to. Brandon, you there? Or maybe he doesn't want to go on camera. I'm happy to ask the question for Brandon. I don't see him popping up in the chat. I'll ask it because we're running short on time, if you can even believe it. When you are trying to highlight a person or persons in class or other place as an effort to change the dynamic of who is being heard, is it necessary, important, or required to ask those people first? I have observed in the Black Lives Matter protests that white people have taken steps to help without adding and then completely derail or distract from the goal. Can we talk about intention versus impact? Brandon wants to talk about everything. Um, and all these questions are really important, so I appreciate them. Um, uh, let's start with how you act as an ally in spaces, because that's really incredibly important. And there are two allyship models that I like a lot. Um, the first one is pretty ableist, and I'll recognize that. I'll, I'll create some kind of, you know, kind of snippier language um, uh, at some point in time, but it's the upstanders model. Um, it's, you know, it's, you know, listen up show up, talk up, speak up. Um, and this really talks about kind of what are the basic fundamental tenets that you should um, abide by to be at least minimally acceptable as an ally to any community, racial, ethnic, intersectional folks, uh, queer folks, women, whoever. And, and it's really about, you know, listening up is about uh, learning and educating yourself. Um, uh, uh, show up is about being in spaces um, that center other identities other than your own. Talk up is about profile raising and amplifying the voices um, and experiences um, of underrepresented folks. Um, and speak up is the most challenging and arguably the most important, but it's intervening and challenging um, when the outcomes that we, we experience um, aren't the outcomes that we seek. Um, and, and so that's kind of generally, like these are the basic baseline activities. If you're doing these activities, 
activities, then you can reasonably call yourself an ally. Some people will say that you are not permitted to call yourself an ally, um, that you have to be, that somebody, somebody else should call you an ally. Um, I'm perfectly fine if you're undertaking those activities, calling it yourself, um, you know, name it and claim it. Um, there's another model that really talks about once you're in a space, how do you act? And I think this goes more to, to, to Brandon's question. Um, and, and really, I think um, one of the Black Lives Matter founders got it right um, in, in using an acronym called ALLY. Um, always um, center the impacted. Um, listen and learn from those um, with lived experience. Um, leverage your privilege and yield the floor. Um, and I think some of the co-optation that's happened um, by um, white people and, and Black Lives Matter spaces happens because they're not doing um, those things. They're not centering the underrepresented folks or taking it on in, um, in an effort um, to uh, extend their own white saviorhood. Um, and, and they're not necessarily listening and learning from what um, people in community um, actually want. And so I do think we need to be reflective and we need to be responsible. And as an ally, um, we, we should accept as a, as a privilege um, feedback and challenge related to our not necessarily always getting it right, right? Um, what it means is, you know, kudos to you, you tried. Um, you know, I get things wrong all the time. Like I'm consistently learning more and more about um, other, you know, gender minorities, for instance, about the experiences of other queer folks, the experiences of non-binary folks, um, the experience of, of, of the folks who are at the farther end of kind of the LGBT alphabet soup. Um, I'm consistently learning and I learn new things every day. I learn new things about disability, differently abled folks, deaf of hard of hearing folks. Um, and there are times where I have to show up and I have to, I'm there, I'm trying to engage. I apologize when I get it wrong or when my impact isn't what I, um, what I intended. And impact is incredibly important. There are two sides of the story. If we're ever going to meet in the middle, if we're ever going to be in community with one another and really understanding one another, we have to pay attention to both of those dynamics. We have to have the right intentions. Um, my intention is to make sure that this community is centered and has all of the equity and privilege um, that I get to have in my daily life, wherever, wherever that is. Um, but you also have to recognize that you can have all the good intentions in the world, but if you did a really horrible thing to somebody and they're feeling really horribly, there's no reason why you shouldn't want to apologize. I mean, we're human, right? I mean, nobody wants to feel bad. Every single one of us knows when somebody has hurt our feelings. And if that wasn't your intention, um, then you ought to um, be in a position where you have enough humility to be able to admit your mistakes and apologize. If, if, if we can't let each other in, right, if we can't um, give grace for mistakes, and if we also can't um, recognize what we do that impacts others, then we will never come, we'll never meet each other at the intersection. We, we, we won't. Wow. So we're running out of time. I can't even believe how quickly the time went. Um, and I'm debating whether I want to ask a hard question or I want to end on, <laughs> on somewhat of a lighter note. I think I, I want to go back to one of the things that you shared mm -hmm. and you talked about active choices and forging your identity and choosing joy mm -hmm. and choosing hope. What gives you joy and what gives you hope? Mm. My euphoria, my joy, um, you know, comes from, uh, I've got, I've got a, a nearly nine month old, um, wow. a, a little foster kid. He's great. We got him about six months ago during the pandemic. Um, he brings me joy, the little videos um, that um, my partner and he create um, together. One looked like a bloody massacre today of, of blueberries. Um, looking at, um, looking at those pictures and seeing, uh, just being able to witness the learning and development of someone so quickly in real time and like feeling the gift of being responsible for someone that that gives me joy um my joy comes from the ability to show up um to a job every day where it's not the most progressive job i'm not you know feeding the homeless um i'm not you know i'm not necessarily i'm um, changing the entire world but i have the opportunity to use my talents and skills every day in a way that i find to be meaningful um for others and, and the ability a gift at this point in time during this pandemic during this economic crisis during these tumultuous times leading up to this election where so many people feel powerless against um uh, against this uh, pandemic um i feel really 
joyful and, and honored to be able to have a role where it's my job to be able to help and give other people comfort and help people try to navigate a little bit more joy and agency and, and profitability and, and expansiveness and, and identity support, you know, each and every day. And so those are the things that give me joy. Um, what gives me hope, honestly, is talking to people who, um, you know, some are in my generation, some are older, many are younger, who um, really aren't about to take no for an answer, um, who will come back regardless of what I even or anybody else might say. And they keep saying, they keep saying, you know, but, but why not? Like, why do we have to do it that way? Um, why do we have to wear this suit jacket? Um, to work. I can think in my hoodie. Um, why do I need to work in the office when the office is reopen? Um, why do I need like really kind of fundamentally questioning the way the society was set up? And that gives me hope because our world was not set up for people that look like me. Um, and so every day, um, I, you, um, Ralph, others um, are working um, to try to create space for ourselves. And the questions um, that we can ask, the questions that the students in the, in the session earlier today were asking give me hope um, that we may be coming to a world at some point in time where we don't necessarily have to forge a way, um, but that a way will be there. And then we can worry about more mundane things like our spa appointment. <laughs> <laughs> or pedicure. That's my or admission to the to everybody here. Nobody heard. We're not recording, so we're, we're not fine. recording. <laughs> Bendita, you said it all. I. It's been just such a joy to to be in community with you before this it. event. Oh my gosh! And and I'm gonna still haunt your castle because I'm on LinkedIn and I share everything that she has. Everybody, follow her on LinkedIn. By the way, she's got all the good I posts. I appreciate that. I want to thank you for this very memorable Stonewall lecture. Your words will reverberate through the law school, I am sure, for mm. a long time after we log off tonight. And I mean that sincerely. And what I want to share with everybody else out there is to just talk a little bit about Bendita's generosity and just how much she will be reverberating through the law school community. And I'm not going to take my words. I'm just going to read the words that are in this um, uh, well, you'll hear. On the occasion of the 2020 Stonewall Lecture, with the generous contribution of Bendita Cynthia Malakia, Roger Williams University School's Law is pleased to offer a one-time scholarship, the 2020 Stonewall Award in Law. This award will support a current Roger Williams Law School student with a demonstrated commitment to and involvement in the LGBTQ plus community and the LGBTQ plus equity and inclusion. Special consideration will be given to applicants whose commitment focuses on areas of intersectionality. Bendita, we talked a lot about representation and barriers into the legal profession for historically marginalized community. Your gift not just in your words, but in, in what you have given to us is gonna give a student the opportunity to focus more on their practice and being representative in the field and less on the barriers. Um, you're gonna open the door to a future lawyer in this profession whose voice is desperately needed. So from the bottom of my heart, and I, I, I'm not one to fluff, because I will still be in community with you beyond tonight. Please. Thank you so, so so much. For the current law students that are here um, and are interested in applying for this opportunity, it's gonna be posted on Simplicity in the next few days. So please check your email for the announcement. Um, that's all we have. I wanna just give you a couple of things of, of events that are coming up mm -hmm. and a final thank you to Bendita. Um, next week, well, actually tomorrow, our Black Law Student Association is hosting She Talks and they're gonna be hosting a conversation led by Black women at the law school on Breonna Taylor. That is happening at 7.30 tomorrow evening. Um, I believe you all should have gotten an email about it, but continue to check your email. There'll be more information there. And next week, we're going to have our next installment of the Equity Roundtable series. It's voter suppression and the intersections with the legal field. That's on October 21st at noon, and more information will be coming shortly. Uh, Bendita, I wish I could hug you. But here we one are. Day. In one day. One day. Not in soon. 2020. But everybody, <laughs> thank you all again for your phenomenal questions, your involvement, and please stay safe. Please wear your masks, and we will see you soon. Onward.
Bye-bye, everybody. Absolutely. Take care. Thank you so much.